Administrator, before you uh, got here, you founded your own small business, or maybe two. Were you Three. Okay. Tell us the obstacles that you faced and how that's informed how you've done your job. You know, I did, I made so many mistakes. Um, I have to tell you that uh, I was in a corporation and believe it or not, I had actually been uh, appointed to the Federal Glass Ceiling Commission. So <laughs> as I was doing the work, trying to help women across the country, I realized that maybe I was hitting one myself. And so I left and decided to start a consultant company. And first, when you say you're gonna do management consulting, people don't really know what that means. And so I try to do what we did at, at 7up where I worked. You know, we were pushing 7up and we called it the Uncola. So I decided to, um, to call my company UnMcKinsey to get the word out <laughs> as to what I was doing. And finally, people understood what I did. You know, when you say consultant, they think you're PR. They don't understand that it's really thoughtful management consulting. Well, because, and all so, do PR, right? because all women do PR, right? Because all women do PR. And so, um, so those are the, you know, the mistakes that you see is, you know, how to position yourself, your branding. And so I took a successful strategy and applied it to my own business. That's terrific. Um, ladies, um, one of you said that bank parking lots are where entrepreneur dreams go to die. <laughs> that, that's someone else's quote, but we, we did hear that. Yeah. You did endorse it? Yeah, did. Um, you have built an incredibly big business. I guess you're in three other cities, 400 employees now, mm -hmm. lines form. Yeah, we um, started in Georgetown, just the two of us, um, and seven years ago on Valentine's Day we opened. And since then we've expanded to um, Bethesda, Maryland, New York City, Boston, Los Angeles, and most recently Atlanta. And we also ship our cupcakes nationwide through another bakery um, near Dulles Airport. And um, it's been an incredible process, um, but we had an unconventional start when we started. It was 2008, it was a recession, it was very difficult to get a bank loan. We did not have a track record um, in the bakery business. We started in very different careers. Simple idea, too. I mean, mm -hmm. how did the banks feel about cupcakes? They were skeptical, and I think um, especially, <laughs> um, you know, most of the bankers we met with were male, and they didn't understand it. The cupcake and, challenge, and, I think. And, I mean, and I think that a lot of the women at our table, too, we were discussing this, is that a lot of our businesses focus on women's services and needs, whether it be makeup or event planning, um, and a lot of men don't necessarily understand female businesses. And so they may be less likely to fund it. Um, regardless, you know, we had a lot of doors shut in our face at the beginning, but we didn't let that deter us. And so we started, we maxed out our own personal credit cards, cashed out our 401k, very small savings. Like we were probably close to 30 when we started, so we didn't have that much of a savings um, built up. But we did a lot of the work ourselves and put in a lot of sweat equity. Um, our first shop um, was in a small size street in Georgetown, not the shop we're in now. And um, we powered through. And when people told us no, we found a way to get to yes. And, um, and we, we made it happen. We opened. And uh, for those of us who went um, to Georgetown Cupcake um, in the beginning, it was, a, it was very small. It was just the two of us. And it was a, a hard process getting it off the ground. But even as we've grown, I think the challenges for small business still exist. No matter where you are in your life cycle, they just change over time. And so it doesn't necessarily get easier. It just gets different. Do you know how many cupcakes a year you make now? We, make, we bake over 8 million cupcakes a year. I yeah, 25. Yeah. Right. Love it. Yeah. Right. Right, but hearing those stories, uh, what I have to share is it was because of those stories that my second, my third business actually became more interesting because after I'd learned my lessons from business one and two, I thought, you know, having had a challenge with access to capital, with counseling and getting work, the next thing I'm gonna do since I'm so frustrated with the banking situation is I'm gonna start a bank of my own. And so we went out <laughs> and got women together who became disciples of change and I said to the ladies, I know how much your shoes cost. I know what that handbag costs. And I, you, know, you always tell me you're frustrated that we don't own our own institutions. We need to build ownership. So let's get together and let's start a bank of our own. And we decided that we would raise $500,000. We'd send our round an envelope around this little brunch we had. And we came back with a million point two to seed the effort. It was really fantastic. That's Women great. are ready to step up and to change the world. Um, so apropos of that, though, the numbers show that women account for a very small percentage of loans, generally in loans and small business. What's the problem? Why is there such an imbalance? Is it because uh, banks don't want to give women loans or women are not packaging themselves well? You start with that and we you can know, do a women, jump on um, Generally, when we're starting business, we're not ready for the 5 and 6 and $10 million loans. We want the small dollar loans. And so that's why at the SBA, we zeroed out fees on loans under $150,000.
Uh, banks also say they're cumbersome. SBA loans are a little cumbersome. Ours are guaranteed 75% but they say that our loans are a little paperwork. So we just launched a new program that we're really excited about, and it's called LINC, L-I-N-C for capital. And I really urge you to go to this site if you're interested in capital, because some women go to match.com for a date, and here you answer some questions and you get a date, but this one's with the banker who responds and uh, answers and says he's interested in your and uh, lending you money. And so it puts you in the driver's seat, as opposed to knocking on door at bank after bank and getting a really slow maybe. I'm going to try something a little different here. Um, I'm going to ask you ladies if you have anything you want to ask the administrator, something you think she should be doing to further help women. Well, I think you guys are, are doing an amazing job and your office is doing an amazing job. And I think um, as a small business owner and female, um, one of the challenges um, we're facing now, and, and um, you know, we've grown certainly in the last seven years, but like I mentioned before, um, access to capital is still always an issue. and. Um, what kinds of things can the SBA do to help um, incentivize small business to grow? Because for small businesses, oftentimes, um, you know, uh, business owners pay themselves last and they finance their growth through cash flow and it, it, you bootstrap it along. And what kinds of tax incentives and things like that can we um, expect um, to help incentivize our growth? If we're making a decision between opening a new location and hiring new employees, um, I think um, anything that the government can do to help us incentivize creating jobs and to um, build new locations um, would definitely uh, help. All right, thank you. I think that's an important fundamental question. Um, let me just um, say that there's a whole lot more we can be doing, but this is what we're doing so far, and so we want to hear from everybody's ideas about how to do more. But essentially, first, uh, as I said, uh, we wanted to make sure that women had a place in which they could get counseling that really suited them. So we opened up women business centers across the country so that there was a place where women could go themselves. Second, we said they want the small dollar loan. We're going to zero out fees on, on those. Third, we said you know they don't want to be walking into banks, so we put up this technology. And fourth, to your point, cash flow. Women will always give up their own to make sure that their employees and their rent are paid. That's just our nature. We're, we're nurturers, and so, and so as a result, we saw that many women lost their credit uh, FICO. And heretofore, when, we, when I got here, I learned that as a result of having a low FICO, you get turned down on an SBA loan. So we just changed that rule, and we said, let's take your personal FICO with your business score, which you maintained, and so now together we get a blended rate and allows more women to get through. As a result of these basic changes, women lending is up across the country by 22% since I've arrived to now. Uh, my name is Alexandra. I'm the owner of Juice Love, a small juice press business. I'm looking for funding to open a bar in Anacostia. But I have a question. Um, what do you suggest when you're trying to start a business in an area that's currently very underserved, but it's an emerging market as well? Because the area I'm looking at, it's in the process of um, DC revitalization, but right now it doesn't look like the best place to start, but there's so much potential. That, that's a great question. Yeah, it is a great question. And just yesterday, and I'll ask them to, to comment too, but um, uh, just yesterday, I just landed late last night coming in from a really beautiful, beautiful community called Brooklyn, New York. <laughs> and, uh, and I have to tell you that I went to see, when I first came on board, I went to see these two gentlemen uh, who teamed up to open up a restaurant in a community just like what you described. And I've been to Anacostia, and I'm trying to do what we can to lift that community. But um, you know what? They weren't sure. They kind of felt what you felt, but they weren't sure. And so they opened up one restaurant, and then they became a destination. And now everybody's sort of following them. And now, of course, the second location that's just down the street is costing them a little bit more. So obviously, you want to lock in a longer term on your lease. You know, some people will go with, you know, a three-year lease, and so if you really feel that confident, you want to lock in your rate on your lease to make sure that you get the uh, depressed, what would be the depressed rate now before the rates go up. Just get a longer term. Um, I want to, can I follow up with you two on that? Have you thought about going into em some emerging areas? I know you're, you know, I don't know where you are in the other cities, but, you know, you're in prime we, real estate here. We typically fund our own growth. Um, like Sophie said, seven years in, we still couldn't secure a bank loan to open our um, seventh location. So we did it from our own cash flow. Um, you know, I think that... For now, we kind of want to pause after opening Atlanta and just focus on the stores that we have in our shipping business to grow that. But yeah, I mean, that's a, that's something that we often think about. Um, from our shipping business, we, that actually kind of dictates where our cupcakes go, and that sort of leads us in the direction of where we should open our next brick-and-mortar store. But the challenge is, you know, being able to um, save enough money to open up another store. 
Yeah, and then just to uh, um, tag along to what Catherine said, we try to use data driven, our data to drive our decision making at our business. So, um, you know, while I'd love to open in some neighborhoods, you know, if, if the data don't, doesn't show that we um, ship cupcakes there, we have customers there, um, we take that into account. And that being said, for, for our Soho shop, um, we shipped a lot of cupcakes to New York City, um, which we found interesting because there are a lot of bakeries in New York City. But um, rents were very expensive, and it, um, all over Manhattan, they were just astronomical. And the only place that we could afford was this um, abandoned um, loft building in Soho, which had been abandoned for 25 years. It had graffiti all over the walls. It had no back wall, a dirt floor. And we made it work because that was the one rent we could afford. And it was a lot of hassle and a lot of work um, on our end to make it happen but we were able to um, pay a rent that we could afford. And so it's normally not a space that we would ever have looked at. Um, and, it, it need, and I think anyone in their right mind wouldn't have taken that space because of the amount of work needed. But I think you do what you can do. And I think those kinds of opportunities um, in emerging neighborhoods or in buildings that may not be ideal um, can present opportunities for you if you're able to like secure um, a more favorable rent or a do, if you are willing to put in a lot more sweat equity at the beginning, um, it can save you money in the long term and be a good business decision. Yeah. And how's that location doing? It's great, yeah. And I think now, <laughs> I think our landlord probably wishes that he had rented it out now because he could have got a lot more money for it. <laughs> it's all built out. But we did. We it was it was a lot of work, but um, financially, like that's what we could afford, and we made that's it happen. Right. right. But you know, I think your questions are really powerful. When and more, you know, just stepping back to to your broader question, I have a girlfriend, a wonderful, dynamic Cuban American. And uh, I'm from Los Angeles. We have this beautiful band shell uh, theater that we call the Hollywood Bowl. And there's always opera and theater and really beautiful, beautiful classic music. And she just said, you know, there's so many Latinos in Los Angeles. What if I could do something with mariachi music at the Hollywood Bowl? And er no one would fund her. No one would support her. And they said, they don't have enough money and they're not going to come to the Hollywood Bowl. And it was a sellout. Oh, uh, wow. The second year she did two nights, the third year she did three nights. It's a phenomenal event. She's now a very wealthy lady and everybody's now trying to do something like what she's That's doing cool. across the country. So I'm just saying, you know, let's not make too many assumptions about what people can do and what they're interested in. And let's try to lift everybody up. Thank you. My name is Chance Lundy and I co-own an environmental consulting firm called Inspire Green. And my um, question is for Administrator Contreras Suite, uh, what percentage of the SBA 8A program um, are women-owned small businesses and what are you all doing to facilitate maybe more mentor-protege relationships between large primes and small businesses? Good. Um, thank you. She's my straight woman. Uh, <laughs> I, I like this. Um, you know, we, uh, I, what I did as soon as I got to the SBA because I wanted to make sure that we were addressing everybody or to the earlier point about disadvantaged populations. And so I reframed the, the work that we do at SBA to now calling it smart, bold, and accessible. And the smart is about smart systems that we're deploying to make sure that we're reaching people that we had heretofore not been able to reach in the ways that I just described, for example, with Link and with changing our underwriting standards, opening the credit box. Um, the bold is about understanding that we're now in a global marketplace, but the A is about what you just framed, and that is that we have to make certain that SBA is responsible to everybody, that we're bringing people that would otherwise be disenfranchised. So just, uh, just early last week, I went to St. Louis to learn from some male uh, men who said that they were really frustrated that yes they were getting a little bit of counseling and they were getting some um, you know cash but they wanted inspiration and that they wanted stories that told them that they could and that there was a pathway for them and so we just recruited Mike Muse uh, from Muse Recordings phenomenal guy who's going to help us go into communities that are underserved but we can do more and so um, we also identified that in low-income communities we weren't getting the federal government to buy enough from those communities. So I launched a campaign called Destination Hub Zone so that we could go in and ask that, you know, launch a federal campaign targeting those communities to make sure that 8A firms could get more work. But I have to tell you that this is the first time after these efforts, and we could share more with you, it's the first time in eight years that the federal government reached its 23% uh, contracting goal for small businesses as a result of these efforts. So That's we're great. really heartened by it. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Um, I, we are approaching out of time, and so I want to give you all the last word. Why don't you start? Just anything you want to tell these ladies? And um, I would just say don't get discouraged. I know there's a lot of obstacles and barri barriers to entry, especially when you're starting a business. Um, and, you know, like Sophie said, seven years in, there's still going to be obstacles that you face. 
but you know, it's the most rewarding thing that you could ever do. Um, and just to keep, you know, take big risks, take big swings, um, and, and keep believing in yourself. Yeah, and I, just to echo what Catherine said, um, take big swings. And I think for us, um, when we started Georgetown Cupcake, we never thought um, we'd be where we are today. We really just wanted to be, start our own business and work together and, and ha um, live our dream and, and uh, live our passion. And um, as we've grown, it's been a really, um, it's been a crazy experience and it's certainly difficult, but I think um, for a lot of women business owners, just take comfort knowing that everyone goes through the same challenges and we're here together in this room to share and um, don't, every mistake you make is a lesson learned and so to learn from those experiences, to share best practices and to support one another. I think that's right. I couldn't agree more with our two successful entrepreneurs. You know, I was just, uh, uh, yesterday afternoon, I was uh, meeting with them some people who call themselves Wikipedians. We teamed up with Wikipedia and they had an edit-a-thon where they were going into Wikipedia to rewrite the stories of many, many leaders in the Wikipedia who had served our country in honor of vets. And so it was a really great story. But one of the things that I learned is they said that when you give a vet a hand, you know, and you reach down to help them out of that, that um, a bunker, that they don't grab two, they don't grab your arm with two, they grab your arm with one, and then they reach back to pull another one out. And I found that to be very powerful because what I see across the country is that women are doing just that, that you and you teamed up and you're bringing two and you're hiring more women. And so I think to the extent that we reach out and embrace each other as opposed to being in competition with each other, let's look at the things we have in common and partner and working together, women can change the world. We are the disciples of change. We know we're the ones that influence our sons and our daughters. So let's do it and influence a, a world that is fair and better for all of humanity. Thank you.